so I want to begin with talking about what sociology is and how we think about sociology and how that might be different than what other disciplines are doing. And um, I'll start here with an idea of group behavior, an example of group behavior. And this comes from the work of a sociologist named Mark Granovetter. And Granovetter was super interested in why it was that people rioted or why it was that um, uh, people engaged in mob-like behavior. And the reason this is an interesting question is that, you know, it's something that we see not infrequently, where people will do things that they didn't expect that they were going to do, but they find themselves doing it anyway. And, um, you know, th this leads to the question, if, if everyone is just acting on the basis of their own interests or what it is that they want to do, how is it that we all end up at times doing things differently? or doing things that maybe we didn't want to do and are surprised to find ourselves doing. And the answer to this question is um, sort of fundamental to sociology, which is that we don't just act in terms of what it is that we want to do. We act in relationship to other people, or in other words, there are aspects of the situation or aspects of other people's behavior that influence our behavior. And the way that we articulate this is usually that sociology is fundamentally a relational uh, uh, social science. And that means that rather than study the individual and what it is that the individual wants and desires, we think about the, the individual in relationship to other things. And those other things can be other people, so other individuals. They can be other organizations. Um, uh, so things like how I exist in relationship to a school and how that school influences my behavior. And to broader institutions, like um, we can think about gender as an institution and how my behavior is influenced by my relationship to gender relations in a society or to the broader culture. Now, in Grandavetter's example, um, he was interested in how it was that individual behavior could be influenced by the actions of others to the point where people might act as a kind of mob and that the group behavior of, uh, is not simply the aggregate of the individual behavior, by which we mean it's not just that every single individual or enough individuals wanted to do something. And the example that Granovetter gives here is um, with what we refer to as threshold models. And a threshold model is a model where each of us may have a certain threshold that needs to be crossed in order for us to undertake an action. And um, that whether or not we end up taking that action depends in part on whether or not the threshold is met for each one of us. So imagine for a moment that there are 10 of us in a room and um, the 10 of us are all students and there's another teacher, I'm not the teacher, there's some other teacher out there and um, that teacher is doing something where we decide, you know, we should really rebel against the teacher. We should do something where we protest what they're going to do. But it's kind of scary to protest against a teacher. And so what we need is enough people to get on board to do this. Now, Granovetter's idea of a threshold was that for some of us, the threshold has to be super high for us to get involved. In other words, lots of other people have to act in order for us to act. And for others of us, the threshold could be super low. Like some of us could just be willing to do it from the very start. We may, could be willing to protest and say, no, professor, you're not allowed to do this to us. You have to act differently. And so if there are 10 of us in a room and um, we are, want to see whether or not the, the class revolts against the professor or does not revolt against the professor, one of the things we might ask is what is the distribution of thresholds within that class? In other words, how, like what does it take for each person in order to act? Let's say that my threshold is zero. And by my threshold being zero, it means that like I am willing to say to the professor, you are acting unfairly no matter what. It doesn't require anybody else to be able to do that. The second person in the class person to my left, has a threshold of one. So for that person, in order for them to join in in the behavior, they need one other person to do it. They're not willing to go alone, but they are willing to do something if somebody else joins. The third person in the room 
has a threshold of two. So if two people join in, they will also join, et cetera. The, the fourth person in the room has a threshold of three. So if three people join, then that person is going to join. The fifth person has a threshold of four. The sixth person of five. The seventh person of eight. What you'll see in this example is that if we get to sort of 10 people participating, it's in part contingent on how many other people participated. So if I have a threshold of zero as the first person, and the second person has a threshold of one, and the third person has a threshold of two, and the fourth person has a threshold of three, until we get to the 10th person who has a threshold of nine, and each of us has, we progress in this very linear way, what we'll soon see is that the entire class will join in, in the revolt against the professor. But this makes you realize for a moment how fragile that is. Because if the class had a different composition, the class never would have revolted the entire class. So if I were not in the class, if there were nobody in the class, who had a threshold of zero, the process would have never started. It never would have begun that the class revolted against the professor, that the class rose up and complained about how the professor was acting. Or if there was no one with a threshold of two, that is, if the person three actually had a threshold of three, we never would have gotten to a revolt. And this is a super interesting thing because what we see is the ways in which social context deeply influences our behavior. And if we just studied each individual alone, we wouldn't see these kinds of dynamics. Instead, we're interested in the broader situation and the interrelationships between groups and how many of us find ourselves acting in ways that we would never dream of in part because of the pull that others have upon us and because of the ways in which contexts or situations deeply influence our behavior. And so here, you know, the, the, the fact, the picture that I have on the slide um, on the screen is, is one of um, sort of looting that happens uh, after some natural disaster. Um, and you know the, the, the idea is that like many of us could never imagine looting a store, but if we're watching many other people do it, we may think, actually, it's fine. It's totally fine to loot this store in this moment, in part because there are no authority figures to stop it, and in part because we see other people doing it. In this sense, when we think about ourselves from a sociological perspective, we don't just think, what are my wants and preferences? What is it that I desire? But instead, how is it that my actions are influenced by the contexts that I'm in? So, um, you know, uh, and, and, and we'll see how as contexts shift, we often act differently or maybe even have a hard time explaining why it is that we did what we did. So in the moment where we're doing something, it seems totally reasonable, totally like, you know, something that we deeply want to do. But then when we're removed from that context, we suddenly have a hard time justifying our own behavior. So if we found ourselves looting um, after a hockey match, which is what is happening here on this screen, um, we may have a difficult time explaining our behavior because normally we wouldn't engage in that behavior, but we happen to exist in a context that influenced our behavior. I'm going to give you, over the course of these lectures, many other examples of this. Examples wherein I'll ask you to think about how context influences your behavior. How it is that situations in other people influence who you are and what you do. Take, for example, a classroom. In a classroom, you tend to take notes and be relatively silent and listen to the professor, me, speak most of the time. Now, that may seem totally reasonable and natural, but if we were two friends out for a coffee right now and you took notes and didn't say anything and just let me speak the entire time, it would be a pretty horrible experience. It would be in some ways really strange for me to just keep talking and never ask you any questions. It would be fairly intolerable and very strange of you to simply do what it is you're doing right now, which is to listen, to not interject, to take notes. 
in that sense, it's not that like you are a, a simply always the same person, but instead that the different contexts that you're in, whether that be in a classroom versus in a coffee shop with a friend, be that in the family or instead at a workplace, you're going to act differently. And sociology is in part the study of how it is that there are actions and behaviors are influenced by others, by the situations that we're in, by the organizations that we that sort of structure our everyday lives, by the institutions of our society and its broader culture. So this brings me sort of to um, uh, what is sociology, um, and you know I will think of sociology through this series of, of courses as uh, it's the study of how societies are organized and how that organization affects the behavior of the people that live in that society. Now, society here, you could think of very broadly or very narrowly. You could think of society as a country. So sociology is the study of how China or the United States or India or Zimbabwe is organized and how the organization of that society influences the behavior of the people who live in it. So what kind of political system do you have? What kind of economy do you have? And how does that influence your behavior? If you live in a very agrarian or farm-based economy, it's going to be different than if you live in an, an industrial or maybe even as we're seeing today, post-industrial societies. And so in that sense, the organization of the economy matters, whether or not you live in a democracy, the type of democracy that you live in is going to matter, whether or not a religion has a big impact on your society. For each of these, it's going to be deeply important for us to think through how it is that societies are organized and how that organization affects the behavior of the people who live in them. But we don't just have to think about nations. Um, we could also think in very, very small terms. Families, for example, have an organization. So there are people who are parents in families. There are people who are children. Sometimes there are other people in the family unit, being that grandparents, or maybe there are um, uh, staff members in a, in, a, in, a, in a household. There are all kinds of things. There could be distant relatives. There could be multiple children from different parents within a household. But overall, that household is going to have some kind of organization and that organization is gonna influence the people in that household. And so when thinking about how a society is organized, we could think about a society in grand terms, like the world or the nation, or we could think of it in smaller terms. You could think of my neighborhood as a little society, a small society that has a set of organizing principles and how that organize, those set of organizing principles are gonna influence our behavior. I live in New York City, um, and there isn't a major highway that is outside of my house, but actually there could be, right? In some cities, there are major highways that cut through the city. Well, that major highway literally structures the behavior of people within that city, by which I mean that the space influences how it is that people act. What do I mean? Well, people on one side of the highway are unlikely to interact with people on the other side of the highway. They may live very close to one another. They may live just feet or meters away from one another, but the structure of that space influences the behavior of the people within that space. And so again and again in sociology, what we're going to be interested in is the ways in which organizations um, of, of space, the organization of institutions, the organizations of different kinds of units in a society influence the behavior of people. This is going to be our primary focus again and again and again. And over the course of these lectures, I'll talk about this in relationship to religion, in relationship to the family, in relationship to neighborhoods, in relationship to race, in relationship to sexuality, et cetera. We'll see again and again and again a return to this theme about how organizations of societies or different units of societies influence behavior. Sociology interlaps, um, excuse me, not interlaps, overlaps with economics, psychology, anthropology, and political science. Um, 
another way that I think about this is that sociology sits at the intersection of the social sciences. So where economics is often the study of economic behavior, psychology, the study of psychological behavior, anthropology, the study of culture, political science, the, the study of political behavior, what sociology does is draw upon all of those insights and try to integrate them into a single discipline. In this sense, sociologists don't study any one thing. They tend to study many different things and they draw upon the insights of their related disciplines in the social sciences. We also draw heavily, I'll just say for a moment, on history and historical approaches. And over the course of this class, I'll talk a lot about history. So sociologists study markets, they study small group behavior, they study attitudes, they study voting, they study customs and traditions. So there are different areas of sociology, like social stratification, which is the study of inequality. It's deeply tied to economics. There is social psychology, which is the study of psychological phenomenon, but primarily from a different angle, not on the basis of the individual, but how it is that contexts and small interactions influence behavior. There's the study of culture, which is tied to um, uh, uh, anthropology, and there's political sociology. So as you think about you know, the broad social sciences, what I'd like you to see here is that sociology isn't a distinct approach. Instead, it's an attempt to integrate a range of approaches into a broad understanding of how it is that societies work. Now, what sets sociology apart then is, here I'll draw upon the work of C. Wright Mills, the sociological imagination. And the sociological imagination is a unique way of looking at the world. What Mills argued um, uh, uh, was that we should look at the intersection of biography and history, or the intersection of our personal stories with the larger social context in order to analyze sociology. And I'm gonna draw on this insight all the time to try and get you guys to think about both the combination of your own personal story and the broader social context as being fundamentally in dialogue with one another and that that dialogue is what sociology is. If you think just for a quick moment about our names or your particular names, you'll see how our personal story is influenced by social forces. So there are legal limits on what you can name a child. Um, uh, in different countries, there are actually sometimes things you can't name a child. Um, if you wanted to name your child, for example, Adolf Hitler, in many contexts, there would be some governmental authority that would say you cannot do that. Um, so there, there's this sort of like legal and state apparatus about what acceptable names are. Your name is, of course, a deeply personal phenomenon. And um, I, my name is Seamus Khan. So um, uh, uh, Seamus is an Irish name, and my mother is an Irish immigrant. She moved from Ireland to the United States um, when she was in her 20s. Khan is a Pakistani name. My father moved from Pakistan um, uh, in the 1970s when he was in his, his 20s. And my parents sort of together, their history is encapsulated in my name. And for many of us, we see this. We see the ways in which our names reflect not just our own identity, but our history and some broader kinds of stories. There are pressures to name children after ancestors. There are negative reactions to certain kinds of names. When people wanna choose a name, they seek to encapsulate something about sort of who the two people typically are as a couple in order to sort of capture the identity of that person. In this sense, our names are deeply personal stories, but that are tied to a range of social forces that influence uh, that name. Um, in my case, Seamus is an Irish name, but Shumps or Shumps, Shumsul or Shumas is a Pakistani name. And so my name seeks to capture a little bit of the story of both of my parents, of the story of that migration, the story of their own personal histories. And it's a way to encapsulate not just my individual identity, but the range of factors that help produce that identity. Again and again, I want you to think about how it is that you can use 
your own personal stories, as well as larger social contexts to explain your experiences within the world. Now, this to me is um, one of the most important graphs uh, that you'll see in this course. And for those of you who might be just listening and aren't actually looking, what this is is a graph of the world population growth. And what it basically shows is that for almost all of human history, there was no population growth until about, you know, it depends on what we uh, identify as the turning point, but let's say 1600, 15 to 1600. And then population growth just shoots up, not just exponentially, but the exponential growth is itself exponential. So it basically looks like a huge cliff a huge, huge clip. Now, this is, from my perspective and many other people's perspective, the beginning of modern life, but also a fundamental transformation of the ways in which we live. And again and again and again, I'm going to point to this great transformation, this truly profound transformation in the world that we live in, and ask us to think about why did this happen? And what are its consequences? So why is it that it took for almost all of human history, why did it take basically, until, we didn't reach a billion people in the, in the world until about 1800. That means tens of thousands of years it took us to reach a billion people. And now we add a billion people about every 11 years, which is truly astonishing to think about. Right? It took all of human history, us, it took basically all of human history for us to reach 1 billion people. And now we do that just a little over every 10 years. Now, the critical thing here then is to ask what happened in the 15 or 1600s um, through the 1700s that allowed for this massive, massive population growth? How do we explain it? and what are its consequences. I'm simply going to say that it's very difficult to explain why this happened. There are lots of things that we're gonna offer up. Um, the primary one that we'll talk about is capitalism, um, the change in the, in the economy, but that the capitalism explanation we should be kind of skeptical of because the growth happened really kind of before, a little bit before capitalism started. And here, the causal explanation, what is the cause of this? can be flipped all of the time. What do I mean by that? Well, we could think about capitalism, the change in economic markets, as being the cause of the population growth, or we could think about it as being the consequence of the population growth, that as populations began to grow for other reasons, suddenly new pressures led to new economic conditions. Regardless of what our answer is, this change fundamentally transforms societies. It profoundly and fundamentally transforms societies. And this is really also 1800, kind of the 1800s, is the beginning of a range of social sciences, a range of scholastic disciplines that become super interested in trying to make sense of this. And one of the things that we'll primarily focus on within this class is how this change led to a new science of society or a new science of the changing world. Um, sociology emerges in the 1800s in part out of two phenomena. One, an industrial revolution. So a change from agricultural societies to basically factories. We used to farm and then we started to work in factories or cities and the rapid, rapid growth of cities. The massive growth of urban life is essential to understanding modern life. Um, we see this in most European contexts, starting you know, uh, basically in the 1500s through 1800s is really when it speeds up. If we were to look at contemporary China today, the major story of contemporary China would be urbanization, the movement of people from rural areas to cities. And so in some ways, massive population growth is not just that there are more people, but how people live is different now. And what I mean by how people live is different now, it's that they live in relationship 
to the economy and to one another in different ways. You know, the me, the, the person that is me that would have lived 500 years ago, almost certainly would have worked on a farm, grown much of what it is that I needed in order to survive, engage in a little bit of trade. The me today produces almost nothing that I need to survive with. That is, I don't grow food, I don't make my own clothes, I don't produce my own shelter. Instead, I produce something else and I rely upon markets to provide me with everything I need in order to survive. This is a profound transformation in the life of uh, a society and it's one that is of deep interest to sociology. Critical here then is this idea that people in cities are increasingly dependent upon one another. And of the sets or structure of social relations that sociologists will be interested in, one of the primary ones is going to be this dependency. So what does it mean to depend upon other people and how it is that we actually now live in a web of interrelations that are absolutely required for our survival? If suddenly farmers didn't produce food, my life would have been catastrophically impacted. In other words, you know, my dependency upon other people to do basic tasks for me to survive is really, really high now. We think about this then as modern societies um, experiencing an increase in the division of labor a division of labor where different groups and different people specialize in particular kinds of tasks and become fairly good at them. And they um, uh, uh, create surplus because they're good at them. But, you know, uh, it can also have a certain set of negative or downsides. And today when we talk about Karl Marx, which will be, um, well, maybe not today for some of you, but, um, a section lecture I'm going to record today, which will be on Karl Marx, will think about this division of labor, this ways in which tasks get divided between one another. The downside of cities is something we absolutely need to consider, or the downside of this industrial transformation. And part of sociology, or the science of society, is a study in part of the ways in which this great transformation to an industrial economy had enormous benefits, but also real harms, and asking how it is that we might restructure society or reorganize it in a way that allows us to mitigate or manage those harms. So early cities, you know, industrial economies had no laws regulating wages or work hours. They had no laws regulating child labor and, um, or workplace safety. There were very few building codes, and this put people at considerable risk. Neighborhoods lacked sanitation for sewage and people got really sick from this and from livestock. There were frequent disease outbreaks. There were children who were working in factories all the time and this you know, created harms. And so part of the study of this great transformation is to think about both the opportunities it provided and some of the negative consequences that emerged because of it. So this is the beginning of an understanding of the science of society. And in the next three lectures, I'm going to take three people who thought about this, in some ways in the moment that it was happening or very close to when it was happening, and outline how it was that they thought about it.